Hello my bookish friends out there in booktube land. In this episode of 100 Classics You Should Read, I want to introduce you to a book and author that influenced Jane Austen. And not only is it an entertaining story, but it is much deeper than it first appears. So, without further ado, let's dig in, shall we? The book I want to introduce you to is Belinda by Mariah Edgeworth. Mariah Edgeworth was a, a very established author before Jane Austen even began writing. And Jane Austen was influenced by Mariah Edgeworth's works. It's often said about Jane Austen that her writing is very witty. Um, and that's true, but her wit takes quite a satirical turn against the social mores and habits of her day because she lived in a very pivotal change in attitudes, um, which would be good for another video. But Mariah Edgeworth, her wit is the classic witty repartee that many of us are fascinated with and would love to be able to engage in, which was so highly valued in Regency Britain and through most of the 18th century before Regency Britain. You know, that quickness of thought, that dexterity of word usage, which makes a person able to hold their own in conversation, um, almost as if it's a sword fight. Now, you get a lot of that in this book, and I'm going to give you a brief synopsis of the book, and then I'm going to tell you how it goes deeper than just wittiness and a frothy, light story. In fact, reading this book gives an insight into how literature really was first used, particularly in the novel. And I'm going to make a little case as to how we've lost that and why I think some of this should come back. One other thing before I tell you the synopsis is that although this is set in the Regency and many people think it's just a story, it is highly relevant today. Because humans don't change, you will find that the actual events and escapades that are used in this story can be found almost identically today, except not with horse and carriage, uh, not with mansions, but people haven't changed. So let me tell you the story. The protagonist is Belinda, the title of the book. She's a young girl who has a very um, manipulative aunt who wants to do the best by her nieces. She wants to get them into good marriages. She wants to make good matches. And they don't have much going for them in the way of wealth or pedigree. But nonetheless, Mrs. Stanhope, that's the aunt, knows how to inveigle her nieces into higher society. And to that end, Belinda is introduced to society by being sent to one Lady Delacour. Now, Lady Delacour, when you read this book, is one of the greatest and most entertaining characters you will find from this period. We're talking about, you know, actually the anti-revolutionary France. Um, the time when they wore the most gaudy outfits, the high hairdos, the, the, the whitened face, all that kind of stuff. And Lady Delacour is supremely witty. She is right at the hub of the world of her day, high society. The high society orbit around her and one or two other great ladies. And Belinda is sent to her in order to be introduced to society because everybody wants to be where Lady Delacour is. And if someone is Lady Delacour's protege, it immediately rises them in value in the eyes of others. Now, along with Belinda, there is another man called Clarence Hervey. He is the most eligible bachelor in society. He has a, a grand income, and he too is phenomenally smart, witty, engaging, charismatic. And so the story begins. Belinda meets him, and she's only about 17, 18, and she's sort of swept off her feet in the romantic ideals, and all the girls like um, Clarence Hervey. But at a masquerade, she overhears Clarence and his friends sort of talking somewhat negatively towards her aunt, about her aunt. And she does know her aunt's a bit of a, you know, not the nicest person, but nonetheless, it shakes her. On top of this, she's living with Lady Delacour and her husband, Lord Delacour, and things are not good. Like many men of the day, high-ranking men, 
He's dissipated. He uh, gets drunk practically every night. Even Clarence Hervey, this eligible bachelor, hangs around with men who they're only out for the, the latest frolic and getting drunk and never taking life seriously. Lady Delacour, though, has a very dark secret and a desolating problem. But only one person knows what it is, and that's not Belinda, although she will later find out what it is. What you learn in this story is how a young girl is introduced to high society and begins to see its cracks, its flaws, and to start thinking independently of fashion, of the way everyone wants to act, the facade that everybody puts on in order to fight their way through the social pecking order. All the way through, there are quotes that you absolutely love, and there's wittiness all the way through. Lady Delacour will absolutely enchant you, even though you know her weaknesses. Even when she makes mistakes, it's hard not to like her. I will say about Belinda, she is a flat character, and by flat, I mean her character arc is point A to point B in a straight line. There's no moving. Now, you might think that's a bad thing, and in some respects, you could argue it is. But when you've got a main character with a flat arc, what happens is all the other characters arc around it. She becomes a canvas on which to paint the movements of society. She falls in love, as I've said, but there is another man that enters the scene. So we have this kind of love triangle turning up. And also you're introduced to Lady Delacour's past and her best friend, Harriet Freak. Now, the name Freak is deliberate. It's not because there's anything physically wrong with her. It's because she's a freak of nature when it comes to society. She throws caution to the wind. She is highly liberal. She likes to shock. She likes to break convention. And Lady Delacour loves this because everything is about the frolic, or as we would say, having a laugh. But there's a problem between Harriet Freak and Lady Delacour. You'll have to read out, read to find out what it is. All of this is weighed up by Belinda and compared to another family whom she meets and whom Clarence eventually meets with the remarkable Dr. X and also the Percivals. I can't say any more because I don't want to give spoilers away. But now I want to go on to why this book is so worth your time. And if you've watched my channel for any length of time, you know that I very rarely say, I recommend you read this book. Um, there's only one or two that I say because so many people have different tastes. But this book, if you approach it correctly, I would recommend it. And now I'll tell you why. So for all of Belinda's light and froth and bounce and frolic and genuinely funny moments and entertainment, there is something much more powerful going on as a subtext. And when you read this, if you want to learn literature, this is a great grounding because it introduces you to really what novels or how novels were used by many people. And it's sort of gone out of fashion. Um, and it's fashionable to, to roll one's eyes at this kind of books, but I think it's wrong. It's because Mariah Edgeworth, she said this book's not a novel, it's a moral. Now, when we hear that, we often think, oh, I don't like moralizing authors, but actually, let's step back. Moralizing doesn't necessarily mean sermonizing, lecturing. It's pointing out via a story certain observations about life which may actually be true. And if they are true, they won't just be true in Regency Britain. They'll always be true. She tries in here, ultimately, to give a guide to young women going into society. But the principles apply to men as well and adults. And of course, you think of today, all youngsters at some point have to leave school and enter into the wide world. And if we're honest, we all know there are many pitfalls and travails that you're going to go through. And even as adults, a lot of us still haven't worked out how to avoid landing in trouble. What Mariah Edgeworth does through this book is she shines a critical light beyond the charm. She shows you the veneer and keeps the veneer permanently in front of you. It's so enticing. But Belinda does begin to see that most of the people in high society are not 
happy. And Mariah Edgeworth uses that to sow the book with aphorisms. Aphorisms are generalized truths. And if you approach the book with the idea of what has the author seen in life? And is it accurate? You can draw an awful lot out of this. So, for instance, I've got a couple of the aphorisms written here. Um, one of them, love quarrels are easily made up, but of money quarrels, there is no end. I bet, I could put a genuine bet on, although I don't gamble, on many watching this video who know people whose relationship is broken primarily because of money trouble. Attitudes towards money cause endless pain. What you see in this story is a family with enormous amounts of money, and yet the pain that it causes. There are other um, phrases which are both beautifully pert, but wake you up if you're reading carefully. For instance, she was exposed at once to the malignant eye of envy and the insidious voice of flattery. How many people go into the world and it all looks wonderful and we all want to have a good time. We all want to, have, but amongst people, there is envy and flattery and discerning what's flattery and what isn't can cause no end of trouble. It was just the same back in these hedonistic days, by the way, pleasure loving days, the, the anti-revolutionary friends. Um, I'm gonna give you some others as well. Scandal never stops after the first word unless she be instantly gagged by a dexterous hand. Now you might think scandal or that's so old fashioned. Actually, no. How much gossip do you hear? Our generation, our current world thrives in the West on gossip. There are endless magazines. An indiscretion amongst friends. Whether you think, oh, I've got a right, I'm just living my life, will always have a consequence. You cannot avoid it. But scandal, if it's not gagged, if you don't know how to act straight away, well, it's going to get out of control. Belinda learns that phrase off Lady Delacour, and Lady Delacour is quite right, but Belinda takes it and, and tries to apply it to her life. In fact, you know the famous expression that a wise person learns from the mistakes of others. A happy person learns from their own mistake, and a fool learns from neither. That phrase is in this book, and we're given examples of multiple ones. Now, I'm not going to go on with many more of them. Um, Listen to this though, this one is an absolute genius. Now, of course, she's talking about women here, but this applies just as much to men. Women who love to set the world at defiance in trifles seldom respect its opinion in matters of consequence. That, I want you to think about that. I'm gonna read it again. Women or men, people, who love to set the world at defiance in trifles seldom respect its opinion in matters of consequence. This is a reference to Harriet Freak, who is all about having a good time, all about a laugh, all about shocking people, all about breaking conventions, all about being my own self, and society should just accept it. The thing is, that's what's meant by setting the world at defiance. I defy the world's standards. But people who enjoy doing it in trifles, in games, what they think is just, Harriet Freak's always saying, it was just a frolic, it was just a laugh. They don't respect the opinion of the world when it comes to consequences. So people act in a certain way and consequences do come back on you, but then people are like, no, I don't want those consequences. People have got no right to judge me. I was only messing around. No, it doesn't matter. The truth is still the same today. Many people wish that they can just do as they will. Again, I think more of the younger generation, but actually it would be wrong to single them out. The older generation is just as bad. So many people demand their rights and think that they can just live their life the way they want to. And I'm not against that, by the way, but what I'm saying is, mucking around and not taking life seriously and it all being froth and light and wit and appearance and social climbing and getting ahead in life above everybody else will always carry consequences, especially 
if you, to, for want of a better word, stick your fingers up at the world's or your community's standards. Whether those standards are right or not, it's not up for, for argument here. It's just if you choose to break them, there will be consequences. Also, what makes you happy? This world that Belinda comes into appeals to her. It is ritz and glitz and glamour. And she says, if I had never come in and seen the top straight away, she said, perhaps maybe for my whole life I would have been striving after it. Now, how many people are always looking for the high life? Having fast cars, having big houses, having a yacht, um, having an income of 100k a year. And yet, does that make people happy? Or do you still find the malignant eye of envy around and the insidious voice of flattery? What I want to say now, you may be listening to that thinking still, oh, I don't like books that are moral or, or moralizing. What I'll say is the story on its own is phenomenally good to read. But I think to a degree, literature, modern literature, which I do love. And by the way, I have another channel on modern literature where I, I'm seeking to find the best books. But it, it's so reticent about giving a moral. Um, sharing an insight into the world which seems to hold true and can spare a person from pain, from even calamity. Because we've gone into a world which is so extraordinarily liberal, no one should tell anyone how to live. I agree you shouldn't tell people how to live. But nonetheless, if you have a nugget of wisdom, share it. And that was ultimately the reason for many novels. Even going back to the Greeks and their epics, there was some intrinsic quality of life that you were supposed to learn from it. And that seems to have drifted away in modern literature. And it actually is one of the things that gives books such great weight. And maybe it's why many modern books, I'm not saying all, but many modern books seem to lack a certain gravitas. It's sort of a, a fallout of postmodernism. In fact, the, the world now is called post-truth. Everyone has their own truth. And that's reflected in the cultural artifacts, that is, programs that are put out on the TV, books that are written, um, the kind of characters who we hold in esteem in society. I would say our society has gone very much to the level, or very similar to where this level of the mid 18th century to late 18th century had got to in the higher realms of society. And you've got to remember that led to the French Revolution. So maybe, and you can see simmering discontent even today in the world, there seems to be a moral dearth. And I'm not talking religious, I'm just talking moral. Founding ideas which lead to happiness and obviate pain. What Mariah Edgeworth does here is a joy to behold. Whether you agree with everything or not, that's not the point. It's a delight to have such pithy statements where if you stop and go, do I agree with that? And bring it forward in time from the Regency to now, do I see similar things happening today? And honestly, when you read this, you will say yes. And in some respects, this gives an education to people. It shows you via story that you're invested in and enjoying. It shows you maybe little aspects of yourself and your own life. Now, what I will say is Belinda is a pretty insipid character herself, but that isn't the point. Belinda is really, she's really a mode or a, an object to, to highlight, to, tran, uh, to paint society in contrast to an idea of stability and happiness, what truly drives happiness. Um, and so you will find good characters in this. You will find a really bad character. But overall, you'll find characters who are neither good nor bad, but are swayed by unthinkingly adopting society around them. So that was Belinda by Mariah Edgeworth. I hope I've whetted your appetite. I do recommend this as a book. It is a good story. It will make you laugh. It has got great wit in it. There are twists which you don't see coming, comical moments. But read it with a little bit of care. Even if you don't agree with some of the things she says, that's fine. But enjoy 
the weight of a book which goes beyond story and tries to share something about life which someone is given time to think about and to put into an entertaining tale. It's not purely about the moral, it captures a wonderful world. And what's remarkable about the world is how familiar it is to today. The last thing I want to say about this book is a big thank you to Emma from Bookish Princess, who is the, uh, the founder of Febregency, that is Regency reading through the month of February, and who I was lucky enough to be a co-host with this year, along with Christy from Dostoevsky in Space and Stephanie from Miss Richards Reads. Um, but I wouldn't have picked this book up without uh, Emma mentioning it. And honestly, you can see where Jane Austen picks up her brilliant ability to, to um, capture the world around her, albeit about 20 years later. So, I hope you've enjoyed this video. Tell me what you think down below. Will you consider reading it? And are there any other books that you have read which you think sound very like this? I'd love to hear your opinions. Until the next time, I wish you joy in your reading.